My name is Ben. I'm the associate pastor here and one of the elders. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come before you today to seek your blessing on our time. We just seek your strength. As we look into your word to see what it is that you have for us. Lord, we ask that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Lord, speak through me that only the things that you want would come forth. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would strengthen each one of us as Christians. Lord, you have called us to be salt and light in this earth, that we would live out our, your calling to us, that we would be strong. As we have witnessed things in this world recently that have made a mockery of your word and who you are, Lord. And so, Lord, we just lift this to you, that we would be obedient to you as Christians, as Christ followers. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage today is Joshua chapter 24, verses 13 through 15. And if you're reading in the Bible, in the seat in front of you, it's going to be on page 185. Our main focus, though, is going to be verses 13 through 15. But I am going to read the whole chapter, or up to verse 28, because we need to get the whole context. So if you'll turn, with there, turn there with me now, and if you'll stand with me for the reading of the word. I think that's important that we do that. If we were to have a color guard come marching down the aisle with the colors of the American flag, we would stand in honor of the flag. I think it's important that we stand to honor the word of the Lord. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt, and I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterward I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt, and you lived in the wilderness a long time. But then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you. 
the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave a land on which you had not but labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. The reading of the word you may be seated. <laughs> Worship locates us in the story of God. God has a story. In J.R.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers, book four, chapter eight, The Stairs of Kirith Ungol, we see the hobbit Sam and Frodo and the creature Gollum climbing the steep stairs of Kirith Ungol as they travel to Mount Doom in Mordor. This has been a long and difficult journey. They are struggling. They just witnessed a great horde of the Urukai leave the mountain on their way to fight battles in Middle Earth. But they take a moment to reflect on the journey that they're on. They take a break. Sam begins this break by talking about the brave things accomplished by others, recounted in songs and tales of old. That not all tales end with a happy ending, though they're the best tales to land in, the happy ones. If you're going to find yourself in a tale, that is. From there, we see a dialogue play out between Sam and Frodo. I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into, Sam ponders. I wonder, said Frodo, but I don't know. And that's the way of a real tale. Take any one that you're fond of. 
You may know or guess what kind of tale it is, happy ending or sad ending, but the people in it don't know, and you don't want them to. No, sir, of course not. Baron now, he never thought he was going to get that Silmaril from the Iron Crown of Thangorodim, and yet he did. And that was a worse place and a blacker danger than ours. But that's a long tale, of course, and goes on past the happiness and into grief and beyond it. And the Silmaril went on and came to Arendelle. And why, sir, I never thought of that before. We've got, you've got some of that light in that star glass that the lady gave you. Why, to think of it, we're in the same tale still. It's going on. Don't the great tales never end? No, the ne they never end as tales, said Frodo. But the people in them come and go when their parts end. Our part will end later or sooner. And so we enter into a story. We've entered into God's story if we've put our trust in Christ. And it is in our service or our worship that we tell a story, and we are going to tell a story when we enter into worship. The story we tell through our service will reflect who we worship. So as we get back to our passage here in Joshua chapter 24, I want to bring some uh, historical significance to this place. So, Joshua 24, we see that Josh, there's a discussion here about the river, and it's, we see that early on. It's, it, it's talking about the Euphrates. There's a discussion, and that, it's talking about distant ancestors, and then more recent ancestors being in Egypt. But then we see them come to Shechem. And so let's talk about Shechem for a little bit. Shechem is this oddly important place. It's probably one of the most mentioned cities in the Old Testament, but gets really little attention today. Shechem seems to be a place of ancient pagan worship center, and we think maybe that's why it God sent his people there so often. We see that Shechem is the first place that Abram goes to when he's in the land. The first time that Abraham's in the land, after he's been called out of Ur and out of Haran, with the first place we see him in the land that he's going to be given, that the people will be given, is Shechem. And you can read about that in Genesis chapter 12. And then... His grandson, Jacob, leaves the land, and he comes back after some time, after he acquires his wives. And the first place we see Jacob in the land is at Shechem. And there's a skirmish of sorts. And this all happens at Shechem. A covenant is made with the people of Shechem and Jacob's sons. Uh, if you'll recall a story, uh, Jacob's daughter Dinah was sexually molested there, and so Jacob's sons wanted to get revenge. Uh, and so they said, hey, fine, we'll intermarry with you guys, but you know, you guys got to go get circumcised. And so when they were all in pain, Jacob's sons came in and wiped them out pretty much. But there was still a covenant that had been made. And then later, in Genesis 35, Jacob collects all the idols from his family and buries them under a terebinth or an oak tree at Shechem. And back to Abraham, when when. Abraham is in the land. He's at Shechem, and he's at an oak tree at Shechem. 
and it's probably the same oak tree. And oak tree trees in the ancient world served as these places of worship to deities. And so we see Abraham worshiping at a tree, and we see Jacob worshiping at a tree, and then we'll get to it, but Joshua will worship at this tree, and it's probably the same tree. So this is modern-day Shechem. The, you can see the ruins of the building, of the, of the fortified city. Ignore the modern-day buildings. <laughs> they weren't there. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that. Here's a wider overshot of Shechem. And I don't know if you can see some of the words up there, but you've got Mount Gerizim on our left and Mount Ebal on our right and Sychar to our right, Shechem in the middle. And it's not... And then Jacob's well is down there at the bottom left. So here's some historical significance to the area. So we also see Jesus in Shechem in the New Testament. We read about this in John 4. Jesus talks to the woman at the well. He meets the Samaritan woman at the well. And he's talking to her. And she had to come from Sychar. And it's probably a good distance, you know, a mile and a half, two miles. And she's got to do this once, maybe twice a day. And she's going to Jacob's well to make this happen. And Jacob's well was dug by Jacob when he was at Shechem in Genesis 33. And we can know that Jacob camped at Shechem because you dig a well, you're not going to camp too far from the well you dig. Jacob's well is about 150 feet deep. Uh, these are just interesting facts. It, it's 150 feet deep. It still draws water today. It was hand dug. It is still there. So Jesus meets the woman at the well. There used to be a stream coming out of Mount Gerizim that fed into Sychar. That's why the woman has to go to, the, to Jacob's well. And you can see that there's a, the ruins of, of a, a Samaritan temple on top of Mount Gerizim. And in the intertestamental period, in those 400 years, there was a guy named John Arcanus that came through Shechem, a Jew by the name of John Arcanus. He came through Shechem, and he destroyed the aqueduct that carried the water from the stream out of Mount Gerizim to Sychar. And he destroyed that Samaritan temple. So you have Jesus talking to the woman at the well, and she says, you Jews say that you're supposed to, we're supposed to, wor you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem, but we say, we Samaritans, we're supposed to say we're supposed to worship on this mountain. And she's looking right at it. They're bent out of shape because the Jews destroyed this temple some 400 years, maybe potentially 400 years prior. And she's got to travel from Sychar to Jacob's well 400 years. Or she's got to travel there a couple couple times a day to get water. I mean, just think about that. Like, what, what were we doing 400 years ago in our country that we're bent out of shape about? But she's, they were. The, and that's, that's, the, that's the rift between the Samaritans and the Jews. So these are just some historical things that are going on in, in, at Shechem. But this... In our text, Joshua 24, this isn't the first time Joshua's been, Joshua and the Israelites have been at Shechem. If you'll turn with me to Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 35. This is maybe a decade prior to our passage in Joshua 24. We're going to read about here. 
This was prescribed by God to Moses and then to Joshua, that when they were to come into the land, that they were to do something. You can read about the description in Deuteronomy chapter 27 about what was going on here. Joshua 8, 30 through 35. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the Law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones, upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the Law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native-born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest, who carried the ark of the covenant on the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first, to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law and the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So if we can go back to that slide that has the uh, picture of Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. That one. Thank you. So imagine this. We can get at the end of Numbers, the congregation of Israel is numbering five million plus. You have half the assembly on Mount Gerizim and half the assembly on Mount Ebal. Two and a half million plus people on Mount Gerizim, two and a half million plus people on Mount Ebal. You have the Levitical priest with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. It's making a natural amphitheater. And the blessings and curses are being read and proclaimed for following the covenant, for obeying the covenant. And it would be loud. It would be thunderous. This would be an an incredible thing to hear. I can't even imagine it. These are not very big mountains. I mean, these are hills by our standards. To have two and a half million people on one and two and a half million people on the other... And they're shouting back and forth at each other. Blessings and curses. By the way, on top of Mount Ebal, you can still find Joseph's altar. Or Joshua's altar. Joshua's altar is still up there. And they've even found Hebrew writing on the stones. So this is the Joshua chapter 8. It's the first time they're in Shechem as a congregation. Joshua 24, they're back here again as a congregation. Two and a half million people, two and a half million people, but maybe more because they've been having kids. Some have been dying in battle, but, you know, they've been replenishing their their, uh, reserves. So, they've got more. They've got more coming. And so, the implication here as we read in Joshua 24, is, as we read in verse 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The implication is, Hey, guys, we were just here a decade ago, maybe two decades ago. Remember all the curses that happen if you don't follow the covenant? Like, this was a sight to behold. Five million people shouting blessings and curses back at each other. Choose this day whom you will serve. Like, this should be an easy decision. Like, this should not be a hard decision. Decision for you guys to make, but we're here. 
So, and we see that Joshua has to tell them, turn away in verse 14. Put away the gods that your father served or turn away from them. Like, so they're already serving the gods of the people in the land. They're still serving the gods of their fathers, but they're also serving the gods of the land already, already. But they're reminded of the covenant to be obedient. And they choose that day to serve the Lord. So what is it to serve the Lord? Serve and worship are verbs. They are action. It means you have to do something. In this case, in this passage, the word service and the word worship are interchangeable terms. Just think about that for a moment. Service and worship are interchangeable terms. It is something done. In our modern Christian sense, we think of we, a term gets thrown around, liturgy. We can often think of what we call high churches. The Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, the Orthodox Churches as high churches, as liturgical churches. They put an emphasis on structure, the way things are done. But liturgy comes from a Greek word that means the work of the people. The work of the people. Worship could be thought of as not, and so we're, we're, liturgy could be thought of anything that is done when we are all gathered. Whatever happens here when we're gathered, this is liturgy. Whatever that is, whether we're a high church or a low church, this is liturgy. But what about liturgy after the liturgy? What about the work after the work, after the service? What about when we go home? There's liturgy there too. So liturgy, again, it, it comes from a Greek word that means work of the people. And in ancient Greek society, and this comes from ancient Greek society, you could be a bridge builder. And that was your liturgy to society. You could be a baker, and that was your liturgy to society. And just like those things, you don't go into those haphazardly, because if you go into building a bridge without a plan, it's probably going to fail. We shouldn't go into our walk with the Lord without a plan. We shouldn't go take it haphazardly. We shouldn't take it lightly. True service comes from a relationship with the divine, with God. When we practice true worship, it comes from whispered promptings from God, from within. And it is not a frantic energy of the flesh. Too often we get caught, I got to help these people. I got to do this, I got to do that. I want to serve my God. Jesus in Matthew 20, 28 says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve and he did not come to be served, and that should be our intent. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. We are here to serve. Why do we serve? We serve for the, because of the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
How much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works? The blood of Christ purifies our conscience. That's why we serve. Not to do dead works. The world does dead works. The world does good deeds. We do things to serve our God. So then the question is, whom do you serve? Do you serve Jesus? Do you serve the Lord? Or do you serve other gods? Other gods could be anything that gets your first fruits of your time, attention, efforts, anything. Is it work? Is it entertainment? Is it ministry sometimes? Are you spending time with God? Or are you being distracted? Are you worshiping literal other spiritual beings? There's a rise in especially Western culture of the worship of pagan deities, of Norsism, of Greek mythological deities, Roman mythological deities. I believe I've even read about people resurrecting some of the Babylonian deities. The truth is they're all one and the same. If you, if you really look into it, they all have this idea of a pantheon of gods, lowercase g, and they just borrow from one, relig- one culture to the next. Where do you worship yourself? Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus told us to take up our cross and follow him. Some people will say, well, you know, I have this physical ailment and I've taken up my cross. And sometimes I think that can be true. But why did Jesus use the descriptor to take up your cross? He was a Jew. How did Jews kill people? They stoned them. Crucifixion was a Roman method of killing. It was foreign to the Jews. To crucify someone was meant to utterly destroy them. And that is what Jesus is saying when he tells us to take up our cross, to utterly destroy our own desires, to utterly destroy that thing about ourself that separates us from his will. We are to take up the cross of Jesus Christ and pursue him. To put away our own desires. The world says, worship self. Again, we we saw this in Paris recently, this last week. Worship myself, worship myself. It's all about self, self self-glorification. We need to be about Christ-glorification. That's what we do when we take up the cross. It is not I who live, but Christ through me, Paul says. It is Christ's will and desires that live through us. Or do we worship Jesus? You know, Joshua actually met Jesus before our passages here in Joshua chapter 4. 
In Joshua, this is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 5, starting at verse 13, Joshua says, it says, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So you see that Joshua fell down and worshiped this man. This man's name is commander of the Lord's army. If we were to read this in Hebrew, this would be a proper name. This would not be a title as we read it in our English. This is a proper name. Commander of the Lord's army. And then he's told like Moses in, cha in Exodus chapter 3, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And he fell down and worshiped and wasn't rebuked for it. We see John in Revelation. He's in the throne room and he falls down and he worships an angel. And the angel rebukes him. He says, you must not do that. I am a fellow workman of God. But Joshua is not rebuked here. His worship is accepted. This is Jesus that we see in Joshua chapter 5. We also see jo Jesus in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Samuel is called out to as a boy serving in the temple three times. Samuel. And he runs to Eli the priest. What do you want? And Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. But on the third time, he senses, hey, I think the Lord's been calling him. And so he tells him, hey, uh, you know, respond. You know, your servant hears. And so he does. And so he calls him a fourth time. And Samuel. And then it says, and the Lord came and stood. He appeared. He was there. And we see, and he was called the word of the Lord. That's the way it's described in 1 Samuel. We can easily reconcile this with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And we know that that is Jesus. Jesus is also described as the name of of the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 9, Solomon has just dedicated the temple to the Lord, and the Lord appears to Solomon. And starting in verse 3, the Lord, and the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Jesus has, God has put his very presence in the temple. He didn't just scratch some consonants on the wall. He put his very presence in the temple. And he said, my name. And like the commander of the Lord's army, this is a proper name. My name. I will put my name. We can see this again in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 27 through 28. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury, and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the peoples a bridle that leads astray. So once again, we see that the name of the Lord is a proper name. 
the name of the Lord. And this is a description of who? Of Jesus. We can see this again in the New Testament, John 17, 6. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Jesus refers to himself as the name. And then again, Paul in Romans 10, 9 through 13. Parts of this should be familiar to you. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does it take to be saved? Calling on the name of the Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And by the way, it's okay to call him Jesus. There's a movement within Christianity to want to call him Yeshua Hamashiach. We don't know what Aramaic sounded like. We don't even know what ancient Hebrew sounded like. But we do know this. We know that the New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek word for Jesus is Jehu Christo, and translated as Jesus Christ. We can call him Jesus. We can make it personal, to have a personal relationship with him, to worship him personally, because he wants that. He wants a personal relationship with us. How should we serve the Lord? We can serve the Lord corporately. It's what we do here, right? We, we read that as an opener, Psalm 27. One thing we ask, to dwell in the house of the Lord. If you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In Isaiah, we get a sense of the grandeur of being in the throne room. And it finds its culmination in, in Revelation, if you continue on. Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. This is that corporate worship that we get this. And so there's a sense that this is happening even here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost." For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So we can worship or serve corporately. We can serve by proclaiming his glory. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
The whole earth is full of his glory. So in verse 14 of Joshua chapter 24, now therefore fear the Lord. The fear is an awe to hold him in awe, to have a sense of grandeur about him, the splendor that we can't even comprehend. That's what to fear the Lord means. We do this with our prayers, our corporate prayers. We do this through our songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, as we read in Colossians 3.16. We teach and admonish one another with these, but we do it in love. We read in Ephesians 5 that we are to submit to one another. We do this in a corporate sense. We serve the Lord with our sermons that are preached. These bless the Lord. We serve the Lord when we come to the table, when we take the bread and the cup, His body and blood, and we remember Him. As we think about coming, being a part of a story, the early Christians, the, like the first century Christians, they were using a term for what we call communion. They called it the Eucharist. It still gets used in some congregations today. This term Eucharist, it means thanksgiving. So we thank Him in our remembrance of Him when we come to the table for what He's done for us. We worship Him through baptisms. When we proclaim whose side we're on. But again, there's a liturgy after the liturgy. There's work after the work. So we can also worship individually when we go home. You see, we have that name placed in these bodily temples. You see, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So just like God placed the name in Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 9. We have the name placed within us if we have put our trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 9 through 10 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You see, we have the spirit of Christ in us. The name has been placed in us. We can worship through spiritual disciplines, prayers, meditating on the word, service, solitude, fasting, These are things that are often lost on us. And just so you're not overwhelmed, you don't have to just start a rush route and go do it all right now. Because the tendency is to, in a week or so, not do them. But you start something, and you keep going with it, and then you add something new, and then you add something new. But it's kind of like physical training, or anything worth doing, gardening. you got to keep doing it, and keep doing it, and keep doing it. It's hard. The initial work is hard. It, it has to become a habit. And so initially, it seems like, man, I'm just going through the motions. And in a sense, yeah, you are, until you get it until you come into the presence of the living God 
And when that happens, you want to keep doing those things because you've met the living God. You've come into His presence. So I'm going to keep doing those things. Like physical training, whether it's running or weightlifting, you got to come in day after day after day after day. And it's hard, but then you feel good. You got to keep coming to be with God day after day and meet with Him because it's worth it. Is your manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ? As we read in first it, um, Philippians 1.27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Is your manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ? Because you'll be known. It'll be proclaimed if it is. That's the whole being a light on a hill, salt and light into the earth. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, we're going to read what this gospel is. It's probably one of the most succinct recountings of the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, I think I have 1 through 7 up there, but it actually goes through 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. By the way, gospel, euangelion, good news. That's what it means, the good news. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, He appeared also to me. Effectively, Paul is saying, hey, this can all be read about. This was all prophesied about. And there's plenty of witnesses, eyewitnesses. Go ask them. I'm not lying. We can worship the Lord. We can serve him by treating people in the unseen realm as well as in the physical. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So do we think of people around us purely as physical beings? Or do we think of them as being spiritual, eternal beings as well? Paul says, we regard them no one according to the flesh. 
If we can think of this in terms of Ephesians 6, where it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities, this evil, this present darkness. What if that mentality of thinking about people in the flesh has led to the current climate in our national rhetoric, the vitriol that we see, to the point that we even have a presidential candidate with an attempted suicide, uh, assassination. If we were to regard people in the unseen realm as people in need of a savior, we might contribute less to the vitriol. Proverbs 18 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And Jesus says in Matthew that judgment is for the careless word spoken. We can serve in how we treat others. I want to leave you with this thought out of 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We serve the Lord and worship him through our obedience. We serve the Lord and worship Him in how we act in this world. We have entered into a story, and that story is one of God's. How are we going to tell that story? Let's pray. Father, we come before you today Lord for anyone that is dealing with unrepentant sin Lord I just pray Lord that they would repent of their sins and turn from it Lord that they would walk in your ways that they would worship and serve you, that they would call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, that you have provided salvation to us, a people undeserving. Lord, be with us now as we go out into the world. that we would proclaim your name and worship you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.